This and all the free content of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you by our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Become a patron today and help support the show while getting exclusive content made just for you. That's patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. And we thank you in advance. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, patrons. It's Matt, and I am sitting near the 111th Pennsylvania Monument on Culp's Hill with uh, author and professor James Brumall. Is that how you say it, James Brumall? Brumall, yeah. Okay, just wanted to make sure. And you prefer James or Jim? Jim. Jim, me too. Okay, James is just too formal. <laughs> he has a book, Private Confederacies, and it's put out by the University of North Carolina Press. He is assistant professor of history at Shepherd University and director of the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War. No relation to Mary Tyler Moore, right? It was her father. It was her father. Yeah, so oh. Mary Tyler Moore... Um, had relatives who fought in the Civil War, and then she uh, was part of the movie Gorey Dow's Lincoln, and yeah. it sort of kindled an interest in the Civil War era. And so she made the decision to go back to the family, one of the family homes, which is in Shepherdstown, uh, Conrad Schindler House. She was the great, 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 great granddaughter of Schindler and uh-huh. bought the house for the university, donated it to what was then the Shepherd uh, College Foundation, and then named it in honor of her father. So that is our, our local that celebrity collection. Is Interesting. I that I had no idea yeah. when I asked that question. I was just trying to be funny. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that's pretty cool. So, Private Confederacies. Uh, the subtitle is "The Emotional Worlds of Southern Men as Citizens and Soldiers." Why did you decide to choose Confederates for this? So i I became very interested in grad school um, with Southern history, um, all facets of it, and uh, it was. There's a lot of contradictions. There's a lot of difficult subject matter. Um, and there is, at least among white Southerners, this this kind of legacy of defeat, right? Mm-hmm. That this um, catastrophic contest of the mid-19th century reshapes that society um, literally into the present day. And so I knew I was interested in some sort of Civil War topic. Um, I sort of went all around. And I became increasingly interested in the very end of the Civil War, this period in which the armies begin to demobilize, men start going back to their homes, and I had this central question, how exactly did white Southerners, how did Confederates kind of make sense of this, this catastrophic defeat? How did they make sense of the collapse of the plantation complex? How did they make sense of a society that was, at least for them, an upheaval, a society that was being redirected in these profound ways. And so I actually started uh, in this period of 1865. And as I dug deeper and deeper into the content, um, I wanted to take my narrative actually back into the antebellum era and then sort of move it past the Civil War era into the Reconstruction period. And so it was just these questions that I couldn't sort of get out of my mind. And you know, at, at the heart of it, I'm an empiricist. I love primary source materials. Mm-hmm. And it was the primary source materials that kept speaking to me and directing me and uh, sort of asking new and new, uh, new questions. And so that's why it sort of went in that direction. Because you're seeing uh, in the antebellum period a, a change, or maybe say at the beginning of the war, you're seeing a change in these men's attitudes and writing styles. Is that what it is? Yeah. So, and I'll keep it brief, but like... No, no, no. Take your time. Um there's this assumption, this prevailing assumption, especially among scholars, that, you know, in the antebellum era, pre-Civil War period, right. white Southern men are very much structured by these external postures and poses. They're very sort of closed off emotionally. They're not willing to disclose elements of, of their identities to certainly other men, mm. maybe only to loved ones. And I said, OK, so that, that makes sense. So what I was confronted by were these letters in which soldiers were writing to other soldiers with a great deal of emotional transparency and disclosure, writing to loved ones in which they were revealing really heart-wrenching stories, um, a profound sense, sense of senselessness in the, in the post-war period, uncertainty. And it sort of seemed as though that facade was starting to shatter. And so as I was getting deeper into the wartime and post-war stuff, I started asking more questions about, well, then what did they look like during the pre-war era? Mm-hmm. And while on one level that persona is certainly true and certainly guides them in their public interactions. If you start looking at diarists, for instance, you see a lot different portrait because they're writing essentially 
to themselves about themselves. And so I started finding men grappling with what they refer to as melancholy, what today we would call depression. depression. They might also call it the blues mm-hmm. um, in the period. And so they were sort of grappling with their position in the world. Very sort of familiar ideas. They For were, sure. they were they, as they were uh, going into adulthood, the responsibilities that they had in this world, how did they sort of make sense of those? And so they seemed in some instances, a lot more vulnerable, um, a lot more emotionally transparent and and available than I otherwise had thought. And that then really forced me to look at that pre-war era more deeply. And that in turn forced me to look at the wartime era more deeply to understand how we get to that post-war period, how we get to those types of disclosures. And so that's why I wanted to go back. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's, that's more interesting, I think, you can because you can trace it over time and the different events that shape these men's lives. And now, but but so I guess to my original question, though, the the Southern men, because it was such a catastrophic change, that's why you focused on them. Is yeah. really the short answer, right? Yeah, that's the yeah. short answer. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, you you mentioned the the diarist, and I think I, I want to make sure I got the was who was William J. Clark? Was he the guy who? had the diary that he picked up on the battlefield and then just continued it. It was another guy's battle or it was another guy's yeah, diary. That's another figure. That's I think, uh, last name was Shand. Um, Shand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. well, do, do you want to go? Well, Clark go ahead. Or, go, give me Clark though. Is he, is he, yeah, what's so, he, is he a typical example of what you're talking about or not? He is. I mean, Clark, I think what's so interesting about Clark is he's a Colonel in a North Carolina regiment. Um, he, the reason why I became so fixated on him, is I looked at his post-war diary. And the post-war diary has a lot of revelations. He was wounded in Mexico during the Mexican-American War. Right. So he already has a pretty significant physical wound that he's carrying into the, the Civil War era. He, he's a man who's in a lot of pain. Right. During the Civil War in 64, he's wounded outside of Richmond. Shell fragment uh, shatters part of his shoulder. And so by 1868, he has these diary entries that are just, you know feeling great pain today, feeling very irritable. He started to drink a lot more. Mm -hmm. He started to have a really difficult relationship with his wife. Um, He seemed to at least have been verbally abusive. Um, His his wife, interestingly, in one private letter tells their son, you know, your father's kind of out of his mind. You need to be respectful, but you need to really heed what he says quite carefully because he's no longer himself. But what was interesting is on the public side, he seems pretty well adjusted. Right. He is in charge of the Newburn Academy, the small school. He becomes a Republican, uh, which isn't popular among, among right, many people South. in Eastern yeah. North Carolina. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, he's this sort of political figure. He's active in the newspapers. Uh, he's in correspondence with the governor. He seems very well adjusted. Yet right. privately, his life's a mess. His wife stays in Richmond. Uh, sorry, uh, in Raleigh, he goes to Newburn, North Carolina. So they're separated for long periods of time. His children are kind of, you know, I think having a lot of trouble understanding the dynamics of the family life. And so here's a man who is really profoundly changed by the experience of wars, not just war, but wars. Right. And so I became really interested in those types of figures where if I could follow them over long arcs of time, I would have something. Now, the problem is, of course, for anyone who's read Civil War correspondence and letters, you know, there's, you know, a lot of men who are killed in this conflict. So their stories end. Right. 62, 63, 64. But Clark is one of those figures where I had antebellum wartime and postbellum materials on. And so I was able to sort of follow him over this longer arc. And so he's a lot more interesting to me in that regard. In during the war, how how was he? Was it the was it the wound in sixty four that really kind of set him over the edge, or was he always kind of a little off? He a lot of his contemporaries um, said he was combative okay. and disagreeable, <laughs> and he didn't get along with his officers, uh, so he's quarrelsome. Okay, um, but there was also a petition that was written in sixty four that really sort of lauded him, and um, he clearly had a lot of support among um, his peers. And so I think he probably was a slightly difficult personality to begin with. And I think these, these two painful wounds just augmented, um, those elements. And like I said, he definitely, he definitely succumbed to alcoholism, um, by the post-war period. The, the way you describe, uh, what a man, the idea of what a man was in the antebellum South. Um, you know, the more I learn about the antebellum South, the more I think that people successfully for that period of time before it was all over, um, lived in a fantasy world. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us what 
what you know the 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 image of a man and what a man was supposed to be and do in the antebellum South. Yeah, I mean, the the first thing that's important to recognize is there's there's different social classes, right. and so um, you know we often think about the antebellum South through the lens of the plantation aristocracy. So these are individuals who were slaveholders. These are individuals who probably wielded a, a good deal of political control. These are individuals who often were involved in duels or contests of honor because um, public reputation was so profoundly important. Those ideals and ideas trickle down among the yeoman um, classes certainly, but um, eye gouging or wrestling was much more common than dueling um, sure. among those classes. But for all Southern men, I mean, this is a very strict social racial hierarchy, right? The, right. There's a there's a very specific structure to this society, and both by law and by custom, white men are patriarchal. White men are ultimately in charge of those whom they deemed dependents, and that was their recognition by law. And so that does does create, I think, a very sort of martial identity among these men going into the um, the wartime era. And and they are very prickly. I mean, what's so interesting about the Civil War to me is you have uh, among Confederates, you have um, this officer class who's fighting a war. Yet in many cases, they're fighting among themselves <laughs> because of these contests of honor, these ideas of reputation. I mean, in the post-war right. period, it certainly happened among northerners and we can look at the hunt hancock and all those debates and stuff sure. but there are so many of these these newspaper battles that ensue in the post civil war era mm. about what exactly happened and and who was right or wrong and and longstreet is is vilified because he uh uh you know is 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 going to attack Lee in, in, in public. And so therefore all Lee's defenders c come after Longstreet. And so there is this public persona that I don't want to diminish or undermine, sure. but it, 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 it's like you said, it's also, I think, grounded in, in some fantasy, right? Do they truly have control over women, children, the enslaved? Absolutely not. No, it's just by color of law that they get to keep it, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to also recognize um, that you know, women are themselves important actors, as are children, as are the enslaved. I mean, it's very clear. And in fact, in the example of Clark, his wife was a published poet. She was a published writer. Oh, really? She had yeah, she had a really important reputation in both antebellum and postbellum North Carolina. She was in correspondence with Zebulon Vance. She huh. was she was pretty famous, and she often wrote under a pseudonym um, because of the dictates of the period. But sure. I mean, she was a recognized force. And so I think that probably also led to some of those dynamics where Clark comes into the household in the post-war period and wants to sort of reassert his identity. She'd been running the household for four years while he was gone. And, um, you know, so that, that in turn leads to this friction, basically. And that's kind of a thing that um, I noticed uh, through what I was reading in the book seems to come up a lot is uh, when the men hear about life back at home, um, during the war as the war wages on and they really start to miss home and everything it's for some of them it kind of pains them to hear it because they long for it and they can't have it and life goes on without them so this is something that I've spent a lot of time kind of thinking about and it's 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 one of those um, veins in the scholarship the historians have thought a lot about as well so on the one hand you can never diminish the fact that soldiers desperately miss home mm. it's very clear there's countless letters that talk about um, a, a quiet day in camp, being sort of just disgruntled, being around the company of men constantly and just desperate for a letter from home. It's very clear. On the other hand, what I sort of argue in here is that all with all that said, and I'm not trying to diminish that, with all that said, Civil War soldiers are thrust into these all-male communities. They're right. around other men. That's the whole point of the military, right? <laughs> right. He, yeah. your, your core group is are your messmates and then your identity is grounded in the regiment the brigade the division the corps so on right and so they form in in essence these kind of ersatz or ad hoc families and what starts to happen and what you're hinting at is the home front and the battlefield are always connected certainly mm -hmm. but they also become increasingly sort of disconnected as the people at home are enduring their own hardships Soldiers are increasingly sort of distancing themselves from this, that home front, right? Not recognizing necessarily those right. hardships. It's just naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Saying, how can you understand? How can you understand the experience of combat? How can you understand the experience of war? You can't. Yeah. And so there are these pretty snippy letters between husbands and wives and between family members. And again, that's not to say that they still don't love them 
deeply, which they do, sure. and they're thrilled when they, they actually de- do mobilize and, and are able to go back home. But it does create these different arenas that are sometimes in competition with one another as they're trying to go through this experience. And it, it is an unparalleled, unprecedented experience for most of the people I look at. Now, there are, of course, a core group who are pre-war officers and have spent long periods at frontier posts and so on. But by and large, these volunteer armies are composed of just that, volunteer citizen soldiers, right. men whose identities are grounded as much in the civilian world as they are in the martial world they um uh you 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 mentioned someone i forget his name uh but in in 61 his letters are you know he's itching to get in a fight uh he and the boys are ready and you know let's have at those yanks and all that type of stuff um but by 1863 it's a much different song he's singing um i'm sure that was common among a lot of people but I guess what I'm getting at is, is how, when, when, when the soldiers finally saw the elephant, as they said, um, was, was there a feeling of what the hell did I get myself into and now I can't get out? I think one of the things that's very important, you know, for us to sort of think about is they had, had, as you're sort of suggesting there, there is this maybe fantasy world in which men are going into 1861 thinking that it is a big adventure. Um, This is an unparalleled experience. They very proudly display their sort of martial identity, get photographs taken with large, you know, Bowie knives, um, pistols in their belts and, and they're going off and and they're going to whip for at least the Confederates, 10 Yankees, um, you know, to, to one, one of their men who may be killed. And there's this profound awakening that occurs among every soldier that I've at least read, where once they are in an experience of war, they are largely horrified by it. Sure. Now, there is a truth. There is a certain exhilaration that men feel. Um, and you can talk to modern combat veterans who talk about that. Yep. Um, and I've talked to a lot of psychologists and veterans who have expressed that idea. But there's also this profundity that they're having a lot of trouble sort of grappling with, which is, of course, the man that they may very well have known since childhood has, in some cases, been decapitated by a shell. Right. Well, why was he killed and I wasn't? Or just going across these battlescapes, and I always say this to visitors, when you come to these battlefields, and we're sitting at one right now, we have the tendency to sort of look forward, which is logical. But I would often say, pause and turn around and think about the scene mm. that they just crossed mm. over. Yeah. What's that battlescape look like? And there are, there are plenty of descriptions of, of it. And it, it's horrifying. Yeah. Men who are in deep, deep pain, b- horses, blasted caissons, d- debris everywhere. The first day's field here at Gettysburg is a prime example. John Daniel talks about this pretty extensively. And they're trying to sort of understand and grapple with this because they also recognize the immediate humanity and their enemy. This is the artilleryman. Yes. Okay, tell yeah. that story. So John Daniel comes down uh, through Heidelsburg on uh, John Warwick Daniel. He's, he's a Virginian. Comes down um, part of early staff. Major? Yes. Yeah. Comes down um, on July the 1st. And I should say, pause the story here. I found, and other people have seen it, of course, at the Virginia Historical Society, this very curious account that he leaves called like Account of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's undated. I'm guessing he wrote it sometime in 63, 64. Okay. He then published something much later that's a very different version. But in this account that's unpublished account that he leaves and now is in the collection of the Virginia Historical Society, he sort of meditates over the experience of battle. And what he f- finds on July the 1st is a scene that he's absolutely horrified by. So he's going across this battle escape. Um, probably in the area of around the 11th Corps where they fought. And he sees these, this, this blast of landscape. And at some point, though, he's struck by this one scene. And it's a dead Union artilleryman. And what's important is the man has no signs of trauma. And so what that signaled to, to Daniel is that he had died what they would deem the good death. Now, wait, I'm just glad you said that because yeah. that was my next question. Okay. What is the good death? Okay. So the good death goes back, you know, really to antiquity. And the idea slash ideal is that you die fully conscious. You are surrounded by your loved ones. You're hopefully not in a lot of pain. You're able to communicate last words. And importantly, you're resigned to your fate. You believe in God and you're going most significantly to the afterlife, a better place. And that's the terminology, a better place. So like Stonewall Jackson would have had 
the good death. He, he dies on a Sunday and he himself was celebratory of that fact. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yes, he's, his wife is there. Dr. Hunter is there. Um, he refuses uh, Brandy because he wants to, to maintain right. his senses. Has last words. His, has last words. And um, he, of course, eventually does fade off consciousness um, and then has his famous, you know, sections on AP Hill. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's the ideal. And what these men are forced to confront is, of course, they have friends who are dying of dysentery in a field hospital. Yeah. They have friends who are being so dismembered on the battlefield uh, that they're unable to speak until they die a week later. Um, so, you know, just so traumatized. So the fantasy of chivalry is just completely it's diminished. Shattered. But Daniel comes across this scene that recalls for him the good death okay. and so he's struck by it and he sits there I, I would imagine he sits there for a minute and he's looking around and the, the fortunes are high now right on the first day the Confederacy mm-hmm. seemingly has had one of the most important victories in the Army of Northern Virginia's history of course day two and three haven't happened yet <laughs> right. on day one fortunes are high yeah. and he, he really begins to not sympathize but empathize with that dead soldier who is poised or, or positioned rather as having died the good death He's got his hands crossed over his chest, mm-hmm. almost yeah. like he's set up like a mortician. Exactly. He's laying under the muzzle of yep. the cannon that Dies he once post. worked. And he has his, uh, like the rammer uh, exactly. on his chest and his hand and yeah. everything. Almost yeah. like he was posed. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and what I would... He was faking, though. That I, I know that guy. <laughs> he was faking. <laughs> well, you know, which brings me to my point quickly is I would urge viewers, this, one of those famous images of the Civil War, Rebel Sharpshooter. Yeah. It's, it's, we know, opposed image because of William Francinito's excellent detective work. It's a posed image, but Rebel Sharpshooter at Devil's Den is posed as the good death. It's a body that has not yet begun to bloat. Mm-hmm. It's a young man. He shows no sign to trauma. In one, there's two images taken, and one of them, he he's actually has his head rested on a knapsack. Yeah. He has a coverlet underneath him. It's the same he's idea. He's handsome, too. He's handsome, so yeah. He's, and yeah. he's not in any bad shape exactly. yet, so it's like, yeah. Yeah, and, and so that's the ideal. And I think that's why Daniel sort of struck by that scene is that it's recalling all of these ideas, these cultural um, notes to him. And so he's very struck by it. And so as he's trying to make sense of the battlescape, which isn't easy, it isn't easy for these no. soldiers, that scene, I think, um, strikes him. I'll also say, pulling back a bit and going to you know where you're sort of going with this, soldiers also have a lot of revelatory sections in their letters to loved ones about their first experience as a battle. Now, I will say they're usually guarded. Right. If they're writing to a sister or a mother or a, a wife, they might sort of put up some facades. They don't want to worry them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there are those disclosures, and when they come, they are really frightening because you know these are men who are talking about burnt bodies and blasted landscapes, and they just, they, they do say, how do I comprehend this? How do I continue to do this? How can I communicate this to you? And they have a lot of trouble, I think, sorting all that out in their minds. Yeah. And it, it seems like, on the one hand, they are a nerd to it eventually, and I understand that. I, I, but I would push back against that a little bit. I don't think these soldiers are that hardened when it, you know, at the end of the day. I think they're all feeling. Um, but they still, I think, even through the end of the war, have a lot of trouble. And you know, Larry, today I'm going to be part of a program talking about Pickett's uh, Charge. And John Dooley, an officer in the 1st Virginia, talks about this. He says every single time that he was preparing for an assault, he had these same emotions, the fear anger, exhilaration, there's a whole constellation of ideas. And that's all part of the equation too. It, mm-hmm. It's it's not reductionistic as the as we like to maybe think of it. These are very complicated individuals who are experiencing a very complex event. And um, what we have are the ways in which they're trying to process that in their letters and diaries. Uh, you mentioned Dooley. Um, I think this is a quote from him. I just turned to, no, this was Hoyle, Joseph Hoyle. Oh yeah, that's another good one. So he writes, we moved for, this is uh, going into Pickett's charge. He says, we moved forward exposed to a hot fire of grape shot and shells, yet we moved on. When we came in range of their small arms, their fire became destructive in the extreme. And then you say down the line, men of the first Virginia started falling, creating holes in the line. And then we go back to a quote, uh, close up, shouted the regiment's officers. Close up the ranks when a friend falls while his lifeblood bespatters your cheek or throws a film over your eyes. And that, that last one is from Dooley. Yeah. That's Dooley, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. 
Um, but the first one's from Hoyle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, there's one in here. I can't, I thought I had marked it, but there's one in here about, uh, the Chancellorsville and the burning bodies at Chancellorsville. Yeah. So. The way he did, but where was it? Is that, that's not chapter three, is it? It, it is. It so, is. Okay. Yeah, so I kind of fiddled with my chronology in there. So chapter three focuses a lot on the Pennsylvania campaign, but I wanted to get into sort of the mindset. So I went back to 61, 62 and into 63 and and the letter in question, maybe you'll be able to find it while we're chatting Keep here. Going. But I think I'm almost there. It it, it is this um, this absolutely horrible scene for those listeners who have been down there. You know, it's a heavily wooded area. It's not far, of course, from what becomes the wilderness battlefield. And so it's an area that that caught fire, not to the same extent in '64 um, that it did in '63, but there were uh, fires that broke out. Uh, because of the cannonades and so on, and um, it, it did start to to consume men. I do have it now. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so please. yeah, this is uh, what's his name? Uh, Torrance was his Leonidas last name. Leonidas Torrance. Leonidas Torrance. He was a casualty here at Gettysburg. He says, uh, "Mother, I thought." Now there's no punctuation in here, so <laughs> I'm going to imagine where he should have put his periods. Um, Mother, I thought I had saw a distressing sights upon battlefields as I ever could see to look at the men killed and wounded. But where we fought last Sunday, the burns set the woods afire and to look at killed and wounded men burning was the worst looking sight I ever saw or heard of. I can't give you any idea what a sight it was to walk over the battlefield and see the men lying with their clothes burned off their hair burnt close to their head, their arms and legs all drawed up with the fire. I never saw such a distressing sight before, and I hope I never may. I hope I may never see such another. And uh, yeah, it sounds like a horror show. And and you know, and and this is Chancellorsville. When did he enlist? Sixty one. Yes. So he's been in since sixty one. Yes. And he's and he's describing this at Chancellorsville and this is what shook him. Yes. And again it's important to you know signal that he then comes to Gettysburg and he's um in the area that's known um as Iverson's Pits. Um oh, uh, a happy place. Yes. And so yeah, and, and that's what I, I want to stress because there there was there is this argument and I don't fully disagree with it, but Gerald Linderman posits it posits it in, in Battle of Courage that by sixty three or sixty four these men had sort of seen it all and therefore, you know, they become pre hardened to all of this. And I, I just don't think the evidence always bears that out. I mean I'm sure there were some that, that oh, were yeah, of hardened. Course, of course. But I mean there had to be, right? But yeah. I mean for the most part, these are human beings with hearts, you know. And yeah. And and you're just you're not built as a young man in, in his case to process a scene like that right. that's not in the Nobody psychology is. I mean no one is of course um, but you know in this particular case think about what a circumscribed world he had you know he was a uh, came from a relatively modest background hadn't really traveled too far and then now he's in this this huge contest Chancellorsville is a massive battle um, and then he sees this scene that's just and he can't describe it but he does try he tries yeah he tries to communicate that to the loved ones at home which I think is really interesting because I think he's having a lot of trouble now processing all of this and and the other thing that I guess I would urge people to think about is you know, Chancellorsville is right on the heels, of course, of the Pennsylvania campaign. And mm -hmm. so I was I was really interested in that fact, whereas there is once they cross the Potomac, a lot of celebrations among among the Confederates. Um, but I mean, these are men who have come off a, a pretty hard campaign. The marching was quite difficult. Many of these regiments are covering 20, 25 miles a day covering 100 plus miles in, in 10 days. And, and so these are men who are becoming physically exhausted. They're extremely dirty. Yeah. They're becoming increasingly detached from their homes. Literally, they're moving farther and farther right, away from right. the South. Yeah. Well, it, you know, you, you bring this up and that's a good point. Because um, uh, as I was reading here, as you're talking about the March North and they're, inner, uh, they're invading, uh, you know, Maryland and Pennsylvania. Now, the way I've always read it in books is that they they seem to portray it more as like a pleasure excursion. We're going on a picnic, we're raiding, we're getting all this stuff, you know, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, but you've actually found and put uh, some quotes in there that show that there's a bit of an anxiety the further they get from home. And so talk to that. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, there are 
loved ones who criticized their soldiers for invading the North. They, you know, if this was a defensive home, then you need to defend home. Right. That doesn't mean crossing the Potomac. But they don't understand those people uh, that a good defense is a good <laughs> offense. Right. <laughs> but you know, you have a letter from your wife that's saying that your your mother. Yeah. That's that in and of itself is difficult. That would shake me. Yeah, yeah. I understand yeah. that. Sure. And then they're getting farther and farther away from the land that they they know and have grown up in. And so I think that's producing anxiety. And you know. I think many people also realized, I don't buy into the argument that Gettysburg is the definitive turning point. It is a turning point in the war. Sure. But I think they did somehow know there was going to be a massive contest. Didn't have to happen here, of course. Could have been anywhere. But but they knew the stakes were high. And so I think that increased the anxiety, too. Like, the, this summer's campaign, it's heavily weighted. Mm-hmm. There have been massive casualties at Fredericksburg and then later at Chancellorsville. The war, I mean, then go back even to uh, Antium Sharpsburg. I mean, the war's getting bloodier and bloodier. The stakes are getting higher and higher. And so, yeah, I mean, I think the men making those marches, I don't think they were on any sort of, you know, joy ride at all. No. And, and their correspondence, their diaries and letters don't reflect it. And let's talk about the marching. Yeah. Uh, it's miles a day, dozens of miles a day, right? Perhaps at, the, you know, what? 20 miles a day. How, what are they doing? Coming so up? It, it does vary. And, you know, I would say some of the union troops coming up, um, are at the very more. end of June are doing yeah. 35 miles a day, but the, typically it's between about 15 and 25 miles, somewhere in that range. So they're doing that. Uh, they're going into a strange land. Uh, one of the guys that you mentioned in here, uh, writes to his, uh, either sister or wife that he hadn't uh, washed his clothes in right. five weeks. Right. And when uh, when they're not picking off Yankees, they're picking off lice, lice. or something like that. Yeah. So they're covered in lice. They stink. They. I mean, I'm imagining if he hasn't washed his clothes, he hasn't washed himself too well in five weeks or so. Uh, so they got to be stinking. They got to be uncomfortable. Uh, the 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 stress of army life in general, the diet, the constant walking. There are these, as you say, sinewy, thin mm. men. They're not these, you know ripped uh, soldiers that we think of today from the movies and everything where right. they, they got the, the Arnold Schwarzenegger body. That's not the way these guys were. Right. That's the body of somebody who's eating healthy. Right, right. <laughs> so, so there's a tremendous physical and mental toll mm-hmm. on being a Civil War soldier, whether even in the North. I mean, it's not just North, uh, just the Confederates, right? I mean, the Northern soldiers oh, yeah. are also stressed. So what, what, Go ahead. Go into that a little bit. Well, and yeah, it is is true. I mean, you know, there there have been some studies about the caloric intake and and like a modern combat soldier, I want to say consumes over thirty five hundred calories a day. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Civil War soldiers, Northerners are consuming salt pork and you know a number of uh, hardtack crackers a day. Southern soldiers, it's gone very, um, you know, pork. Uh, maybe some cornmeal, cornbread, things like that. But the caloric intake for both armies isn't nearly high enough, nor is it balanced enough. They're dehydrated in many instances because these roadways, and it's so hard for us to imagine these numbers. That's mm-hmm. the thing that's, I think, yeah. impossible to get your mind around are the numbers. These roadways are filled with literally tens of thousands of men. They're kicking up dust. Mm-hmm. They can't see anything. The armies are, are moving pretty well at one point, then they'll get bogged down because maybe they need to step aside so another brigade moves forward, or they're bringing up a wagon train, or any number of different things. Whenever they're stopping, if they can, they're cooking, co- uh, making coffee. Coffee, which I, I subsist on too, de- dehydrates you though yes and 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 so you have all these factors and then you haven't probably heard from home in a while if you're a southern soldier because of course the correspondence is now getting really spotty because you're on the move right so now you're worried about what's going on at home as you're going into this unknown territory and then you think about all the things that sleep deprivation malnutrition uh, malnourishment are doing to the mind and it, it is not a very uh, appealing picture (laughs) and it's something that I think we just don't think a lot about because and this is not to diminish the importance of battles I get it I study battles but I'm really interested in the experiences of camp and campaign because that's where the soldier spent the vast majority of his life north or south there's no way around it battle was an extraordinarily unusual experience they spent most of their time in camp or marching and so that's the the more holistic portrait, and then that's when you can really understand, I think, the hardships that um, these armies were experiencing. Again, and this is a transcendent story: Eastern theater, Western theater, North, South, whatever you want to have. Conditions vary on the ground, material conditions, um, but there's a lot of themes that resonate across the board. So, you know, we, you uh, 
we like to say about the Civil War that it was, you know, brother versus brother, and sure there were cases of that. But you also have brothers literally fighting alongside of each other as well. They're all coming from the same town, same area, these companies. So tell us a little bit about the Futch brothers. Oh, yeah, sure, yes. sure. So it's fitting. Um, obviously, you're listening, so you don't know where we are, but we're yeah. um, positioned right between the upper and lower slopes of um, Culp's Hill. And so... Right right by the 111th Pennsylvania, yeah. for those of you who know where that is. Yeah. And uh, my friend, uh, P. Carmichael, uh, alerted me to a letter collection that's housed at the North Carolina State Archives. And uh, he didn't tell me much deliberately because he knew the power of the collection. So I went down there to look at a whole bunch of stuff. And then I said, oh, I saved it for the end. And I was like, I'll look at these letters. Uh-huh. And by that time, you know, I had probably quite literally read... I would say thousands, easily thousands of Civil War letters. This letter collection is unlike anything I've ever read. And where is this? Uh, in Raleigh, Raleigh, Raleigh North okay. Carolina. The the two brothers are yeoman farmers, non-slaveholders, relatively poor. Um, John Futch was a little bit older, had possibly been in the army, then discharged because of illness, and then comes back in 62. He's not a happy soldier. He suffers from disease. Uh, he misses his wife, Martha, a lot. They're in the third North Carolina. And uh, Charlie seemed a little more, he was a bit younger, seemed a little more into the martial life. But what's so interesting about the Lara collection is it's John Futch was almost guaranteed to have been illiterate. Hmm. So all the letters are from someone else's hand. Okay. And so we have this insight into someone who otherwise would have left no letter collection. And they're here on July the 2nd. Um, the assault, as you know, kicks off quite late in the day, 637. Um, so it's already getting sort of dark. And 3rd North Carolina makes their way um, in the saddle between the, the, the two slopes of um, Culp's Hill. And at some point in the assault, John Futch is struck in the head with a mini ball. And he's rendered, as his brother says, speechless. John takes him off the line. Charlie lingers. He can't speak, which is crucial for that good death. Mm -hmm. He's uncomfortable. He's desperate to talk to John. John can sense that. I imagine he pulled him off somewhere going in the area of of Benner's Hill. And then he dies on July the 3rd and John buries him. So it it took the, like the top of his head off, right? Like the, it's the, the, there's five or six letters that, that offer little snippets of information and all we know is he was struck in the head we yeah. don't know but I think what it did is it probably hit somewhere around the temple yeah. and it, it impacted his brain and it's a very graphic scene and here's yeah. a guy you have to understand again he wasn't really happy to be part of this invasion to begin with he wasn't happy to be in the army frankly to begin with and so this sort of sets them off and what I would call one of the most remarkable sets of letters from the Civil War era, and I, I, I'm not being hyperbolic here, um, I think Pete would agree, um, and he's done a lot more fudge than I have, um, ensued after the retreat. So by July the 12th, John starts riding home again. Again, someone else's hand, but mm-hmm, John. Mm-hmm. And there's, I think, ultimately, I think it's seven death letters. And two of them are by the same hand, and all the rest are by different hands. And each one gives an entirely different perspective, more or less, on the experience of Charlie's death. And that to me is telling. Mm. And wh- what I would say is there is a letter that was clearly written by someone who was, was literate, very well versed in writing protocol. He has a very kind of ornately written scripted letter that has a narrative that one would immediately understand if you read 19th century letters. Talks about Charlie's death talks about um, the the promise of the afterlife. He's he's far better off now. He's much happier now. It sort of signals all the things you would expect by the cultural dictates of the period. But what is interesting is there are two or three letters that are phonetically spelled. Um, the the handwriting is very poor. It was someone who was 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 not terribly well educated. Did no writing protocol, and John starts to just really reveal a lot more about how he's feeling Mm. and the Mm. phrase that was so striking to both Pete and myself is I'm almost crazy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so in the 19th century, when they experienced traumas, they often situated it in the heart, soldier's heart, sad heart. It was a physical ailment. That's why in the post-Civil War period, when men went to um, 
veterans' homes or hospitals, uh, asylums. They only spent six months there because they thought it was easily mended. In six months, you're good to go, get back into society. And that's why there were instances of violence and alcoholism and drug abuse and, and murder in some cases. If only Suicide. six months would yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. And they just didn't know. It was a, a sure. pre-Freudian age. They didn't do a psychoanalysis. But but John was clearly tapping into something because he says he's half crazy. He understands that his mental orientation is becoming a moored. Right. He understands that he's been profoundly impacted by the trauma of Charlie's death. And it's entirely understandable. Sure. Um, not only, of course, were they brothers, but he had been in this horrific experience on July the 2nd. And you just think how how disorienting it must have been. And he's, and he's mentioning that he's lonely and he misses his brother and, and he's thinking of deserting. Yep. Right. He, he starts talking to Martha about how he's eager to get back home. Yeah. To see her, to eat her food. And, um, of course he does ultimately, um, desert. Uh, he's part of a party that Pete again talks about in greater detail in the war for the common soldier. Um, and he's eventually shot, um, in early September, 1863, for the, 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 you know, what they call the crime of desertion. Yeah. And, um, you know, the story resonates because, of course, it is one that, that is found in lots of different liar collections, but it's so unusual because of who he is. Yeah. This yeoman farmer who, who is, again, probably illiterate, and we have this incredible glimpse. And the other thing that I would say is, it is, I don't want to use the word authentic because I don't think that's fair, but it's a lot more transparent, maybe. That sure. description, I think, resonates. And and um, Stephen Barry down at the University of Georgia, as part of a larger project, this uncovering more of these you know, common voices, uh, transitionally literate people. And what that is revealing is that once you start to um, amalgamate these collections of, of illiterate, transitionally literate people, those types of points of view are more and more common. We've just read so many published letter collections from the middle and upper classes that we have a pretty skewed understanding mm, of the war. Mm, now, mm. granted, much of what I did was archival research and unpublished collections, but even those collections are all privileged by class. I mean, most right. of the collections that survive are from sort of well-known families. Sure. And this isn't true across the board, of course, but right. there's some truth to this. Yeah. Um, they're big collections. The Civil War section may be one or two boxes in a 13 box collection. Futch is a, it's a, a folder. It's a folder <laughs> in the state archives. There is no other Futch story. There's right. no other Futch letters. Right. It's just this bizarre. And of course, Martha's voice doesn't survive. We have no letters from we Martha. And that's also one of those things that's just so frustrating. There's so many instances where I have the soldier's voice, but not the wife's voice, not the I have voice. I have a chest of, well, not a whole chest, but in, in a chest I have of my grandfather's things, um, there are several bundles of, uh, letters that he wrote from the war, the World War II. And they're to my grandmother, they're to my uh, great aunt, his sister. Uh, none of them are their responses. None of them are what... So the, the women saved his letters, but he didn't save theirs. And it's annoying. Yeah. Because <laughs> I want to know what they're responding it, to. It is. And, you know, what I would say is, because I've, I've been asked all this before. I mean, in many instances, this isn't, there, some, sometimes it is deliberate because people will say, burn my letter. Yeah. But what more often than not happened was this, you know, a soldier is getting in line of battle. They drop their knapsacks. The knapsacks have correspondence, whatever they're saving. Lose it that way. Yeah. They're desperate for a fire. They need paper. They're going to burn the letter that way. Right. There's all these things that happen. It rains. It pours. Everything gets soaking wet. So, I mean. They die. Y and they, they get they buried die. with everything. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, there's all these scenarios, whereas things going to the home can very easily be put into a box and very easily be preserved. And then sometime in the late 19th, early 20th century, the archivist comes to the family and right. says, what do you have from the war? Oh, I have. And then, you know. And, the, the, you know, there there are other dimensions to this story, of course, but I think there's just this very practical element as to why we don't have those voices, but it's incredibly frustrating because then you just don't know their side of the story. Right. You know, what exactly was Martha saying? And there are instances, of course, where we do have um, the wife's voice and those letter collections are among the most famous mm -hmm. <laughs> because we can get a lot more holistic picture, but um, it is it is frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Well, so speaking of women and for the, uh, the homeschooling parents that are listening to this, if you want to... Uh, do the earmuffs. I'll give you to count of three to get the kids out of there. Three, two, one. Okay. So speaking of women, um, do you, at any, I've always wondered when I read about, you know, the life of the soldier, the one thing that there isn't a lot of information on, uh, 
um, in in modern works, and I don't know if you get to it in another chapter in this book or not, but is women and men, the you know the sexual longing for their wives and sweethearts and all that stuff, or prostitutes and things like that. Do you get into any of that in here? And I don't. I mean, I so I I've so okay. The letters themselves are often very, very guarded in that regard. The right. ones that aren't are very famous. And um, uh, 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 Judy Giesberg has, has written about this. She's a Villanova. Um, there's that book that came out years ago, Sex in the Civil War. There's a couple of famous one, works, yeah. and it's because those letter collections are so unusual. So I'll, I'll, I have a couple of things to say here. So okay. first... Almost all the correspondence that I did read, where I did have both voices, they're very veiled. Um, they're they're very shrouded, and so there's not a lot in there that um, is explicit. Um, you have to imagine that you know um, by the dictates of that culture, uh, sexual intercourse was appropriate. Um, they often had large families, right. and so there must have been that type of longing. Um, then there's this other element that, that you're speaking of, but, but I, it's not in the letters that I've read. It's just not there. I, mean, um, I would imagine Futch, if he's having other people write his letters, exactly. he's not even more. Yeah. yeah even, you don't want to, I mean, it's one thing to talk about that way with, talk about that with your wife, but then to have your buddy hear your intimate thoughts and memories is a different story. Yeah. So yeah, I understand that. Okay. Um, there are are though lots of documentable instances of venereal disease yes. um, being rampant in, in armies that were stationary and armies that are near urban centers and the uh, rates of prostitution skyrocketing. And so it's very clear that soldiers um, did in many instances uh, solicit prostitutes and engage in, in, in sex with these prostitutes and um, in, in, in cases succumbing as a result of that to venereal disease and that's a pretty you know well documented sure. um so obviously it's going on it is yeah these are also these are young men in their 20s right so of course they're going to be doing this yeah and it, it's interesting though again that um you have to get at that type of stuff different ways too so you have to look more to medical records because again it's not really that discussed right. um l soldiers occasionally talk about sort of going into town, drinking, probably visiting process. But again, the language is very horizontal sort of, refreshments. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 it's curious. And so what I would say is, you know, it's a totally different argument, but um, people call the civil war, the first modern war, which is a problematic term anyway, but they're mainly referring to the technology and the tactics and things like that. Right. The Civil War is square, sorry, squarely situated in the Victorian era, and in that instance, it does maintain those 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 veneers and facades, and uh, it, it is a very closed off world. That the the break into modernity that we think about, I mean, in correspondence and things like that, I don't think comes until the late eighteenth, oh, sorry, late nineteenth, early twentieth centuries. And so, I would say that despite the intimacy that men talk about in terms of traumas and other types of feelings, th there are certain areas that are too taboo. They just yeah. don't talk about. And again, I feel like I, at this point have read enough to say that with some certainty. Sure. Um, and the, the exceptions to the rule are out there. Um, and in many instances have been discussed in other words. And they're very eye opening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, a friend of mine was, I don't know if he was bidding on it or he just found it on eBay when he was looking for other civil war letters, but he sent me, um, a photo of a civil war letter. Someone was uh, auctioning off on eBay and supposedly it's real, mm. but the terminology used in there, it was like from a soldier to his cousin back home. And I think in Indiana and, uh, the way he, they're talking about the local girls and what the cousin's doing with them. Have you seen this one? Do you know what I'm talking no. about? Oh, okay, because you, you look like you, oh, no, <laughs> you recognize no. it. It's, uh, I didn't know they talked that way back then. Yeah, and yeah. And then they do. Right, well, and <laughs> there's there's two points. And one is, this will go way back in time and may not make immediate sense, but if you think about the Puritans, yeah. they're supposed to be the most sexually closed off people ever. Over a quarter of all children were conceived before marriage among the Puritans. So I mean, sense. they were clearly engaging, you know, in these, these types of intimacy. Um, the other thing I would say that does pop up a lot that what your point kind of recalled, men are very willing to be flirtatious and they're very willing in a cruel way to talk to their wives about it. 
You and mean flirting with other women. Yep. So they'll, they'll that does pop up a lot. That they they looked. Um, they you know they went into town and they saw a number of very fashionable ladies yeah. and were very happy to go to their home afterwards. And it's 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 a streak of really cruel writing that I've had a lot of trouble understanding. Yeah. Why would you do that? Well, I mean, I understand why in many instances because of the gender dynamics of the period. Why would you do that to your wife though? Um, and the the Pinder correspondence is the probably most famous mm. of that example, but you see it a lot in some of the letter collections that I read that men are very happy to tell their wives. I wonder why you would do that. Why would you do that? I mean, I think what it's think? another assertion of, of, again, this sort of masculine patriarchal identity, right? Yeah. We are, are, are at the top of this social order. And while we may be away, you need to understand that you're still subordinated. And I'm, if, because I'm a man in this society, I can move in those arenas. I mean, it, it, it's entirely taboo for a woman to have a married woman to have flirted. Look at morning rituals. Yeah. A married woman who loses her spouse in theory could be mourning for two entire years. Right, right. A man who loses his wife can get remarried without any sort of public social censure almost immediately. Right. And that's the gendered nature of that society. To a teenager, and yeah. he's like forty. Yeah, yeah. 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 There, and it, it was, it was, and it was really normal. Not, yeah, not taboo. But it's, it's interesting. Maybe he's, maybe when they they would do that, they're also saying, uh, "I may be flirting with them, but you're the one I'm coming home to." It's kind of a way to make to remind them of how special they are. <laughs> maybe <know? laughs> not the women they're flirting with. You, who I'm writing, right, and I'm I, coming home to. I, I, I would say to connect it back to one of your earlier points, though. There are many instances, though, in which men do feel increasingly disconnected from that civilian world. And um, I have found this in a lot of the letters and the diaries where they say, I am so dirty. My teeth are so black. Mm. My beard is so long that I am not welcomed in you know, civilian society. I'm not welcome in civilized society because I have become immersed in this soldier's world. And I think they kind of obliquely express these fears like am i able am i ever going to be able to reintegrate myself into civilian society after this conflict because the conflict has changed me so much right yeah and and so you mention um in the in the uh ken burns civil war shelby foot tells the story of uh getting to swing uh Forrest's saber, right. saber over his head and, and a conversation he has with Forrest's granddaughter and, and he tells her that, you know, Lincoln and your grandfather and she was not very happy about yeah. that and he kind of chuckles and says, Southern is very peculiar about that war, right? right? And I, f I find that to be an interesting thing for him to say as a Southerner okay. but um, at least he can recognize it. Uh, but w what, what they are peculiar to this day about that war. And and why? I mean, is it the shame of defeat? It did the what did the defeat do to the Southern man and the idea of what a Southern man was? When when I was in grad school, um, I read a, a pretty famous book by C. Van Woodward, who was a historian mainly of the the New South era, but it was called "The Burden of Southern History." And the burden of Southern history sort of claims that, at least for white Southerners, not for black Southerners, certainly, but for white Southerners, they were the only people up to Vietnam who ever knew defeat. Which is true. Yeah. And then he sort of talks about how that set them on this very distinctive course and how they, um, in many instances, suffered you know, major economic disaster, really, in the, in the post-Civil War era. And how, how it, it created the stigma in, in their identity as, as a culture, as a people. And I think I've always been interested in that concept, and it's a lot more complicated than probably Woodward you know, sort of reveals, and there's a lot more to it, but there is something very distinctive about that fact. And the lengths to which white Southerners then try to sort of reclaim social, racial stability in, by their terms, mm -hmm. by their terms, not by those certainly of... of, of uh, Republicans or by African Americans, but by, by their terms, and that's a, sort of a profound struggle. But they ultimately, in some ways, are quite successful. I mean, we must understand that, you know, we as a people, um, in many ways, have been as much shaped by lost cause mythology mm. as we have about, um, you know, Northern armies and and and, and their victories, uh, right. the the one cause, um, as Barbara Gannon calls it. 
and 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 so you know the the argument is often made kind of glibly, but I guess there's some truth to it that militarily they lose the war, but culturally they they win it, right? Right, right. And and so that that post bomb era though is a sort of grappling with defeat and grappling with um, gain some sort of restoration of what they would have recognized as a familiar again social racial order. Um, and you know Woodward's book is is interesting. He he sort of became like a historian philosopher, you know, okay. toward the end of his career. Yeah. And so he himself grew up in Arkansas. Um, he was educated in Chapel Hill and then he spent most of his career either at Hopkins or, or Yale. So he moved north. But he, he was always interested in the South as kind of an entity and, um, you know, how, how, how white Southerners kind of understood themselves. And so it is a, to this day, it's a pretty good, easy read. It's a very short book. But it is a meditation on this fact, you know, that they up to Vietnam were the only people had known defeat. And what did that mean? You're like, you're like the, you're the losers of the country. Like you're the one group of citizens who lost. Yes. So yeah, I mean, it would, although I'm sure other people will go, well, what about this? What about that? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people lose I'm, I'm but <laughs> to simplify things. Uh, so I would imagine, and especially because when you start the war, you're coming from being top dog in your circles, you're in your society. Uh, even if you're a poor white, you're still better than a ensla- an enslaved black. So, you know, you, you, you know, you're the king wherever you go. And then now all of a sudden you have to be equal with the people that you used to be better than. And uh, not only that, but these stupid Yankees that it could take one of you to whip 10 of beat you pretty bad. And so how humiliating is that? And what, what amount of self doubt must that give you? In fact, I think self doubt is one of the terms you use in the book. Yeah. The, the concepts of uncertainty and self doubts, I would argue were largely unfamiliar to most white Southerners in the antebellum era. Again, men grapple with it in their diaries, but not publicly. They're forced to publicly (laughs) grapple with it beginning in 1865. And, and, and that sort of shapes for me, the, what I look at notions of masculinity, like how do men sort of recreate a familiar notion of masculinity once they themselves have been emasculated? How do, how do they reconstitute um, a society that um, has seen the profound shifts that, that you spoke of? How do they do all of these things? And, and so that's why in the, in the last sort of section of the book, that's why I sort of try to play with and understand. And, you know, I look at it in, in, in the, the bleakest of terms, unfortunately, because there is this massive, um, resurgence of, 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 of violence, paramilitary organizations, the Ku Klux Klan, and many of the veterans that I look at were part of that post, uh, post bellum violence. Yeah. And wasn't, um, uh, the, what was the first guy that we talked about? Uh, the drunk, the oh, drunk Clark, from the Mexican war. Yeah. Clark. Clark actually goes to war against the Klan. Oh, uh, because, against the Klan. Yeah. Because okay. he becomes a Republican. And oh, right. so he, um, is part of a group that is mobilized by the governor, um, in North Carolina, but there are many others I look at, um, and, and it's a hard organization to track because the historical record is very quiet. The right. best source we have are, um, uh, the investigations that were done in 1871. There's, there's over a dozen volumes where they go state to state and start interviewing scores of African Americans who had been intimidated by, um, or had violence uh, done to them by the Klan. And so we have that testimony, but the, the Ku Klux Klan and similar paramilitary organizations left very few paper trails. There were a sure. couple a couple sources in South Carolina that uncovered and um, other areas, but um, finding names is particularly hard, but those testimonies reveal some of that. And so what some, some uh. historians have done is they have found in some instances parallels between Confederate command structure, the ranks of the Ku Klux Klan in 68... 1868 to 1871 um, roster roles of different Confederate infantry units, not exactly paralleled, but there are some correspondence to, yeah. Okay. And, and, and so there is this backlash that occurs, this aftershock in the postbellum era um, that is, is grounded in all the things that we just spoke of. There's these feelings of anger and fear and um, in, in the worst instances, the results in, in really terrible acts of violence committed against white Republicans, African Americans, um, in some instances, Democrats, but very rarely. Um, but it's, it's a major backlash. And it's this assertion, again, of a, of a white masculinity yeah. um, that tries to, on their terms, you know, what they would say is re- reassert a familiar social racial order. Yeah. 
It's it's dangerous to defeat someone and change their entire way of life, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, because you're go, you're inevitably going to get some kind of a backlash somewhere. Yeah, I mean, and you know, that's one of the things that people have talked about a lot. Had Lincoln not been assassinated, what what would have Reconstruction looked like? And I mean, yeah. it's really hard to say. Um, of course, in hindsight and all that, but yeah, um, the way in which Reconstruction unfolded was a very messy and even process. And, and while the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments um, to the Constitution stand, um, what we know, of course, happens is almost immediately, um, so do um, black codes become enacted, um, so do the foundations of what become the Jim Crow era start mm-hmm. to rise up in the 1860s and 70s. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's just whatever political gains, social gains, racial equality that people had hoped to enact become really undone. And that creates in turn this legacy that frankly we're still dealing with today. Sure. Um, and yeah, we're only what, 50 years, 60 years out of it? Yeah. That's not a long time. No, and I mean, again. I know people who lived under it. Yeah, and, and the legacy is still fun. there. Yeah, yeah, the legacy is still there. Sure, and and so that's why you know the National Park Service in particular has connected the Civil War to civil rights and a lot of of their initiatives right now because the connections are very clear. Sure, um, that post Civil War era moving into the twentieth century just shows how much was left unresolved. I, and in a way, I kind of you know well we have to because there's more of them than us. We have to blame all the generations since the Civil War sure. for for kind of thinking, okay, that's taken care of. Let's move on when it really never was like, but it seems like people go, wow, the civil war answered that question. And it didn't. Yeah. It just was a part of it. One of the most dangerous things that I've seen circulating a lot recently. And I, you know, I just caution readers to, to or listeners to, to be careful is when you hear the term reunion and reconciliation, you need to think deeply about on what terms. And I'll blame Ken yeah. Burns for part of this. And I love Ken Burns and yeah. I love the Civil War. I think it's yeah. a great documentary. I've watched it literally hundreds of times. But <laughs> in the first episode, in the first 10 minutes, not too far from where we're sitting, he shows the iconic mm-hmm. soldiers shaking hands across you know, the bloody chasm, in this case, the stone wall. So well. And it, it's a very nice or a neat ending point. And, um, the book is a little big, but uh, David Blight's Race and Reunion is, a, is worth listeners' time. And what Blight convincingly demonstrates is that in that post-Civil War era, reunion, reconciliation did happen, but at the expense of any sort of meaningful discussions mm. of the legacies of race and slavery. And so um, in many instances, these reunions were exclusionary. Uh, many African Americans were were placed in subservient roles as as staff. Um, many black veterans weren't included, and so reunion, yes, did happen. Reconciliation did happen, but on what terms? Yeah, and 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 at what expense? And and that's part of the again the mythology that we think the war sort of neatly wrapped up in the eighteen eighties and eighteen nineties, when it really wasn't. I think though today that sounds so crazy to us, but. I don't think if you think of it in terms of how they viewed everybody other than themselves, white people back then. I mean, today, if something happens and we have a reunion, everybody come on in. Right. Yeah. But back then, it's it's not the way it was. So, I mean, for the the big schism in the country was between northerners and those uh, white northerners and white southerners. Correct. Yes. Okay. And the what it ended up becoming in the end was that they were fighting over freedom for blacks and everything. Um, but the argument started with the whites and then it, it ended with them come, you know, coming together. And so I think I understand that first generation. It's like, we have to get cool with ourselves right. first and then we'll let everybody else deal with the, the other races and all that other stuff. Yeah. Cause that's the way it seems to me is that that's what the thinking was then. I mean, I don't know. Not- yeah, no, you're right. And I think the other thing though, I, I would add, which is also relatively new in the scholarship. I know I've thrown a lot of books out there, but I mean, um, Carrie Janey, who's at, um, UVA wrote a really good book that talks about in 65, 66 union veterans, United States army, they're, they're angry yeah. <laughs> and they're not allowing many, you know, Confederate veterans into the reunions. Right. Um, and um, the national cemeteries, of course, were structured in a very specific way. It was it was United States Army dead, Union dead. Um, 
And so even in the immediate post-war period, when we think they're already moving towards reconciliation because we have this tidy narrative of Grant and Lee at Appomattox, <laughs> which discounts, of course, the Trans-Mississippi Theater, what's going on down in North right, Carolina, right. all that. But beyond that, th- that's the, the tidy narrative. Things are wrapped up. We're good to go. We've, we've concluded the war successfully. These two generals, both heroes, have shaken hands. But, I mean, again, the veterans had a lot of animosity. Now, granted, the reunions do eventually serve. They, they calm down. They, they do find moments where they, they, they shake hands across sure. the, the, the stone wall. But times pass. Yeah. But, and they're but old. They're, they're mad. You know, they're yeah. mad. And, and they, can, well, yeah, they just... can test monumentation in the post-Civil right. War period. And they can test, um, you know, what these battlefields are going to look like because you know, it was for them a very key victory and they had very strong opinions at least some about the men who are on the other side of um the field or the wall or whatever and yeah. and, and so that's sort of lost in the popular narrative too right because we only focus on those moments the celebratory moments right but, but that, and that's to my point is they're still squabbling over it yeah. so for them to to be like oh yeah why don't we include uh black soldiers in these reunions they didn't want to include them in the war in a lot of cases so you know, I mean, it's in other words, what I'm saying is now we have a reunion for something. We invite everybody. We don't say, no, these people aren't allowed to come in. That is a result of years of, uh, since the Civil War of us, each generation working to undo or somehow atone for previous generations sins yeah. in that regard. No, I think that's. Absolutely but I fair. think for it's it's unfair for us to look at them through our eyes today Mm -hmm. because they we don't have their eyes and they didn't have ours yes you know yeah and and it's like any other kind of conflict where you're you know it's more important to be able to see this person you once wanted to kill as a friend than it is to just hug the entire world right you know what i mean yeah yeah. yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I mean, it, it, and it is immensely. Not to defend the segregation. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying, though, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I'm trying to make a sense of. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's right. And I guess I would also say, too, though, even then, it, it's not nearly as you know neat as, as we might otherwise oh, think. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, and I mean, you know, I always say, how could it be otherwise? I mean, this is 750,000 is the new right. death toll. Americans die in this conflict. Um, it's a brutal conflict, as we just talked about. Passions ran incredibly high. The stakes were incredibly high. I mean, something like that is really hard to sort of get over. And um, that's why the United States is in some ways very unusual. Civil wars are typically not celebrated around the world. <laughs> right. And um, it has <laughs> been, in a sense, sort of celebrated here. And, and that's unusual. It's for, weird. Yeah, you're right. For global history. And it's because the, the scars and the traumas run so deep that that they are thought of in very different terms in other places and so um i think for me it's amazing that we were able to go through that and 100 and almost 160 years later we're still together sort of yeah and i mean there is the the promise you know there's the promise of change and there's the promise of progress and we can't diminish the fact that the war does and emancipates four million people four million um, enslaved african-americans are freed um, the 13th, 14th, the 15th amendments are monumental gains. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of important things that come sure. out of the war that we can't diminish. Um, Medical but at advancements. The same, at the same time, though, we, I, I, I'm, as a historian, you know, I'm also like, ah, uh, you know, there's all these problems, though, also that, that never got resolved. Sure, sure. So, as a as a amateur uh, psychologist who knows psychology from Dr. Phil, <laughs> um, I, I seem to understand that. <laughs> I'm 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 trying to figure the the see I think historians should also have psychology degrees yeah yeah uh, be like a minor in psychology or something because I think history and all the things that we're talking about it's like psychology has everything to do with all of it right you know um, so I don't know that's an aside yeah no and I mean it's it's, it's interesting though because um, you know the my not to get into all this but like you know. The, all scholarship gets criticized and criticisms and, and early on when I was working on this and still just presenting it, one of the criticisms that I, I got occasionally was the fact that I'm working like the emotions history. I'm a little too close to psychology, sociology, and some historians are actually really worried about that. But to me, as you said, I think it's actually sort of part and parcel of what we do. Yeah. Well, understanding that I'm not in that discipline and understanding that they're trained very differently, but, but there's some really important things that we need to sort of uncover and reveal about the human mind sure. and that we can discuss. But why, why are some historians leery about that? 
Um, be- well, because, uh, and this is true. This 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 is a right criticism. We can never understand fully the emotional experience of our historical actors. We can only understand the emotional expression, okay. and so um, I can't recapture from a paper entry how someone felt i can only understand their projections i can only understand how they're trying to sort of represent it but i can't understand their core emotional experience see maybe i'm an empath because i read things and i can totally i think i can totally feel the horror or whatever it is that they're describing because i can picture it and I can imagine what that's like. I, I could take something like a paper cut on my finger and extrapolate it to having my hand taken off by a cannonball. Do you know what I'm saying? So Yeah, and I sympathize with that. I think what they would say then in turn is, well, you know, you're in the 21st century. You, you, you don't have all the equipment um, or the context for the 19th century. It's, true. Yeah. That's true. Of course. Yeah. And, but and, I'm talking about human beings. I mean, how different are human beings you know, in our heart and soul and mind and psyche 160 years later. Yeah. And you know, it's hard. It is hard. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, you know, I don't have a ready answer for you. I always say, you know, we have to understand that on the one hand we can, we can associate and I would encourage you to, um, but on the other hand, it's a very different context. I mean, we, there are things that we just don't get. Like right. even if you go on a long hike, you still can't understand uh, a long march without, <laughs> yeah. without bathing I mean, you know, and all these different things. And, and, you know, yeah, we you have to do it. Yeah. 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 And, and so there's this disconnect that we have that we can't ever really bridge. And, and even if you did do that, you're still not doing it with the threat of going into a big exactly. battle the next day. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you will never be it. We'll be able to simulate it and maybe get an idea and imagine the rest, but you're right. We'll never, hopefully we'll never know what it's like to have to do that. It, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's where I think, um, you know, again, this was pretty early on and maybe my ideas weren't as well formed then, but, but those are some of the sort of critiques that I, I got. And, yeah. um, I kind of just, I can, you know, I, I tried to learn from them, but I also sort of thought I had a path. I wanted to keep going with it. And, and, you know, since then that sort of genre of emotions history has become more popular, but, but your point going back to the initial one is, is, is right. I, I read actually a lot of anthropology, sociology, and psychology when I was in grad school and then yeah. afterwards. And so that informed how I wrote the book. The book's weird. I mean, to no, be honest, but, you but know. I love, but this is exactly like right up my alley. In fact, I asked Pete Carmichael, I said, I'm like, I want to read a book that really gets into like the head of a soldier. Like, I want to know about the traumas and, and, you know, and all that stuff. Like, and he said, oh, this is the book to get. (laughs) And and I was like, okay, great. And, and then, uh, I'm reading through it now to prepare for this. And, uh, uh, I, I can't wait to finish the rest of it because I like the way you're writing it. Like it's the way I think, and it's exactly what I've been looking for in a book about, soldiers in the civil war so i'm very excited to finish it well thank you and um i know you got to go and so we'll uh what time is yeah. it yeah uh, do you uh, yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. got, got another, got another program on the, on the all books. right so we'll let you go uh again the book is private confederacies by james j brumel um i recommend you get it it's on addressing gettysburg.com slash books you can get it there and uh Jim, thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, Matt, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the, the coffee and the muffin. <laughs> um, oh, my pleasure. And uh, thank you for the, the lovely By venue. the way, actually, you should thank our patrons because oh, I, okay. I buy food for our guests okay. because of them. Okay. So well, thank you all. <laughs> I had just come off a bike ride. I was very hungry <laughs> and I'm getting increasingly tired. So I need to get my coffee. So thank <laughs> well, there you. you go. Well, thank <laughs> you, everybody. All right. Well, you have a good day, Jim. And uh, all of you, thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Yeah, I really, I really have been enjoying this, reading it. It's.